Welcome to Songbird Sade Knits, a podcast where I take you along with me on my knitting journey with stops along the way to explore the beauty of other fiber and needlework crafts. There will be time for reflection and a little bit of introspection too. Thank you so much for joining me. This is my very first podcast. I had some positive feedback on an instructional video uh, that I did as part of a music festival recently, and that was the very first time I've done anything like that. And I really enjoyed doing it, so I decided I might uh, give this a try. Both as a way to um, provide some, hopefully, entertainment to other people, uh, maybe some instruction, but also as a way for me to um, try something new in general and to uh, start a new aspect of my crafting uh, life and knitting life. Today I would like to share with you, um, I would like to start by sharing with you some of my knits that I've made over the years without a pattern. And the reason why I want to share these with you is because I want to explore with you my inspiration behind knitting, my creative drive, what really uh, got me into knitting in the first place and what keeps me going. I think it's always important to uh, revisit that. If you're a creative individual, it's important to sometimes just stop, take a step back and reflect upon what it is that you enjoy about the creative process, what it is you enjoy about the things that you make, and to give that feeling a little bit of space to grow. Otherwise, it, you can find yourself a little bit stale sometimes, or um, what I've been noticing in myself lately is a desire to quickly finish a knit and get on to something else try, to try something new. There's nothing wrong with that. I am learning a lot that way. But I also miss that feeling that I had when I first started knitting, the feeling of exploration and the feeling that I wanted to knit the ideas that I came up with on my own. And that's what I would like to go back to a little bit and try to explore explore that a little bit more and give it some more space. So I'd like to share some of those knits with you today. I've taken some notes, so I'm just going to have a look here at what I've written. Um, in addition to that, of course, I will talk about some of the uh, projects that I have on my needles at this time, and I'll talk about what I'm wearing as well. And I'd also like to ask you if you see anything of my own knits, if there's anything that you might be interested in knitting yourself. Um, I am thinking of putting out a pattern or two, something very simple um, for either a very small fee or for free, depending on whether or not I think um, there's a lot of uh, skill involved in knitting it. Um, mainly I want to do this for myself to see, um, to learn about the pattern writing process and uh, just to see how that goes, to see how I feel about it and also just to learn the skill because that is quite a skill. Um, so I would be interested if, um, in knowing if there are any of my patterns that uh, you might be interested in knitting yourself that'll help me figure out which ones I might want to spend some time on. And uh, yeah, so let's just, let's just get to it. I'd really like to show you what's in this basket. These are all uh, accessories that I've knit over the years without a pattern, just um, mainly being inspired to make something that was practical. So the inspiration came from, first and foremost, a place of need, I guess. 
Hence accessories. Um, plus they're uh, easy to, uh, they're approachable for beginner knitters. Very forgiving in terms of not having a pattern. You can kind of just uh, make that up as you knit and uh, you can also size it as you knit, whether it's for yourself or someone else. It, it is a really good place for beginner knitters to start. That being said, I would now say that I'm a somewhere in the intermediate zone of knitting experience, and I still knit accessories all the time. They're a great way to use up yarn from sweater projects, um, or if you have something, one skein or ball of something really special, uh, it's a great way to use something like that. So I'm knitting accessories all the time in between my larger pieces. <clears throat> I'm just gonna take a break. I feel like I've been talking very quickly, so I'm just going to uh, try to slow down a little bit. I'm not drinking tea, I'm just drinking hot water. I do this a lot. I find it very soothing. Okay, I'm going to start with probably to this day my favorite thing to knit. I knit some fingerless gloves years ago with the fingers in them and then you know they just kind of cut off somewhere not all the way to the tip of the finger and I loved wearing them. They're so practical and they look great and they don't take that long to knit. So I made a bunch of pairs of these. Eventually I stopped knitting the fingers because it's quite fiddly and I found that you didn't really need the fingers. Um, it was way much easier to just knit without putting those fingers in and they functioned in some cases better because you can kind of tuck your fingers. If you're cold you can tuck your fingers inside whereas you can't do that if, if your fingers are all wrapped individually. Um, so I've made many of these over the years for myself, for friends, for family, and I continue to do so. I find it's just, it brings me a lot of joy to make them and I never need to use a pattern. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some of the ones that I've made recently. Some of the older ones I've made, are they've fallen apart, so. Well, here's the oldest pair actually. These are falling apart, but they're still very much wearable. So I believe I made this. I think it's a cascade. Um, obviously two different colors, a black and more of a, like a taupe, taupe color. And I knit all of my gloves on double pointed needles. And these are, these are an older, an older pair. You can see they're kind of fraying at the thumbs. Um, so a little worse for wear, but they still function very well, they're very thick. And what I like about these is that at the time when I knit them, I knew nothing about color work at all, but I really wanted to do some color work. And so I was experimenting with holding two strands of yarn together, two different colors, and just sort of mixing up how I did that and mixing up where in a piece I might um, add the second color and add a contrast color in and I came up with these this idea by just um, Twisting the yarn in between each stitch basically so twisting and using one color twisting and using the next and I just Had to found that you could do that and create at least two different uh, stitch textures so this is um, this is not ribbing this is all stockinette stitch um, but you can get a vertical pattern by alternating each one uh, in, a, in a row and then here you can get this I don't know what you would call that it's not really a flea stitch and it's not a hound's tooth but you could get this pattern by um, alternating both along a row and then um, across rows as well and it creates a very, very dense, not very stretchy uh, fabric. So they are kind of tight. Um, but once on, they're very, very warm. And I love them. I think they have a bit of a almost medieval kind of look to them. 
and I still to this day love wearing these. Um, and I feel then and now I felt feel very proud of myself for figuring out how to do color work without carrying strands behind and coming up with just a very experimental project and a great result. So I, even though they're kind of coming apart a little bit, I do keep these and I, I do enjoy wearing them. Um, some more recent uh, fingerless gloves that I've made are oh, sorry, sort of variations on a theme. They're all made with Alifos Lopi and they're all made from leftover yarn from uh, Lopi sweaters, Lopi pezas. And if you haven't tried making uh, accessories out of Lopi yarn, I suggest you give it a try. Uh, a little bit goes a long way and um, it creates very, very warm accessories and very durable. You would, might think just from touching the yarn in a skein that um, that it's going to be too soft and fragile once you use it, say, on gloves, something that's going to get a lot of wear. But in fact, the opposite is true. It's, um, it remains very warm and very lofty and very durable. So for example, these were the first fingerless gloves that I made with um, some leftover Alifos Lopi from a sweater. And I have worn these... I wear them every season. I maybe made them three seasons ago, three or four seasons ago, and I wear them. They're my most worn gloves. I ha I'm not even sure I've washed them. Um, so they've taken a beating. They, they're worn a lot, and they're, they look as good as the day that I, they came off the needles. Um, so this is what they look like. So all it is is stockinette stitch with a thumb gusset. I really like using the thumb gusset on um, on fingerless gloves. I find it gives the best fit and also for designing purposes it really is, in my opinion, a balance between the simplest and the most practical because um, you can design basically this rectangle but this is all uh, this is all the same stitch count from cuff to top and then you just add in the thumb gusset. So you can really get um, any design you want. It's a lot easier to fit it on if you don't have to really worry about the thumb because the thumb's kind of just extra. But I do like the thumb gusset because also you can move your thumb freely without sort of stretching the main body of the fabric and distorting the design. Um, so all this is is stockinette stitch, a little bit of ribbing on the cuff, mostly just for decoration and then a cable panel. This is a staghorn cable. And I absolutely love these mitts. I find they're very simple, and, but still really beautiful. Um, so I love wearing them. Another variation on this, again with Alifos Lopi, I just made a longer version. Same thumb gusset, a little bit of uh, one by one ribbing detail on the top and bottom and then a cable panel. You can see the cable much better with this lighter yarn. And that's what I wanted. I wanted my, my efforts to show off a little bit more. And these are just longer, so they're more of a gauntlet style uh, fingerless glove. So they're very, very warm. I love wearing them with, um, if I need to wear a bit of a lighter sweater, but I still want to be warm. I'm coming to you from uh, Southwestern Ontario, by the way. It is, the, you know, far south in Canada, but it gets cold. Today, I think it's around negative 15 degrees Celsius, so pretty cold. Um, but I can wear a bit of a lighter sweater with a good heavy wool jacket, and if I put these on, no wind is getting into my coat from the sleeves, and it's almost like wearing a thick woolly sweater. So these are amazing. I wear these a lot. And then the other pair, that I've made. Again, Alifos Lopi. Um, I just went for a little different style here. So I did a longer cuff, same one by one rib, same stitch count, stockinette stitch all over. 
and instead of a full uh, cable panel on the front, I just did a little decorative sort of rope detail along the side just to give it some a little bit of interest but to still be a really easy knit and easy to wear. So those are my most worn fingerless gloves. By far, I would knit another pair any day in Alephos Lopi. I just love, I love the way it turns out for fingerless gloves. Next, I'm just going to show you some hats or toques as we say in Canada. Um, that I've knit without a pattern. I will say this, I knit a lot without a pattern, not, not sweaters yet, but accessories. There's a lot of unknitting that has to happen um, because I don't really plan things out in advance and I, as of yet, do not know how to do the math to uh, figure that out, like with a gauge swatch and actual measurements. I just don't know how to do that yet. Um, also, it's just kind of my personality to not measure things very well so I I personally don't mind unknitting at all I just figure it's part of the process and it's a really good way anyway to get used to the yarn and how it how it behaves once it's knitted up into a fabric and anyway for accessories they're so small that um, by the time you kind of figure out whether or not it's going to be the right size that almost would have been the size of your gauge swatch anyway so I just I just get started and then go from there. Um, so for 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 toques, luckily I've made quite a few now. I can just go back to a toque that I've made in the past and um, get the measurements off of it if I if I want to do that. So I'm just going to show you some other simple toques that I've made. These two are Alephos Lopi left over from a sweater. This one you can see is left over from this sweater that I'm wearing. It is just a very, very simple toque, one by one rib, stockinette stitch, and um, I, I think I, I'm not really sure how I did the decreases there. I think I usually like to divide the crown into either quadrants or into equal, equal parts and then do decreases that way. I just kind of like the way that turns out better. So that's what I have done there. That's what it looks like on. Kind of an egg shape, but this is one of my warmest hats that I own, and it's perfect for our winters here. Here is another Alephos Lopi hat. This one's all over, two by two rib, and um, it's more of a beanie style. It's, it fits a little tighter to the head. Not tight, but it because of the stretch in the fabric, it goes back in around the head. And it is extremely warm as well. That's what it looks like on. And uh, this one, it was a bit hard without a pattern to just figure out how these decreases would work. You can see I just kind of, at some point, I guess when the two by two rib wasn't totally possible anymore, I just changed to stockinette stitch. You can kind of see it when it's, um, not on your head, but once it's on your head and stretched out, you don't really notice it. So this is why it's good to just experiment. I mean, I'm, I knit this a while ago. I'm sure I had to do the decreases and then decide, oh, I didn't like that. The, that's the way it looked. So then I undid it a little bit and started again. But um, it just feels so good to knit something as a way of exploring design elements or as a way of exploring how things are put together because it's, it's definitely easier to use a pattern and just follow it um, but sometimes you can kind of miss how it's how it works how it's put together so sometimes the best way to figure that out is to just do it yourself just a couple other hats that I've made this is again just a simple stockinette stitch but what I did was reversed it so this is a one by one rib just made a bit longer so that I can fold it up and then you're looking at the back side of stockinette stitch, which just gives a bit of texture, just a bit of interest because regular stockinette stitch appears quite flat, but the pearl side just has a bit more interest to it, or at least, at the very least, it looks different. It doesn't look like your typical plain toque. 
and all I did was crochet a little leaf to a leaf applique to give it some interest. And here I divided the, the crown into quadrants, um, but I did a more of a spiral shape. I don't know if you can see that. It's not even, it kind of, because the decreases are all leaning the same way, it ends up being a spiral shape. So that's another way you can just add a little bit of interest if you if you like that. And this one's more of a, not really slouchy, but it has some, it has some extra fabric there. I really like the fit of this. I find um, this is probably my favorite fit for my head shape. A little bit of extra fabric at the top, not too much, I find looks best on me. <clears throat> and the final hat I want to show you is just a variation on knit and purl stitches. It's kind of, I don't know, I guess it's my version of a broken rib. Um, I just came up with this. It's a two by two ribbing with a bit of a rolled hem here. And then instead of continuing the ribbing all the way up, I added pearl ridges just kind of whenever I felt like it. And what that does, this is already a bit of a slouchy hat because it's kind of large, but what it does is it allows the hat to sort of crumple a little bit more instead of, instead of doing what rib tends to do, which is cinch in like this, it allows the hat to have some give this way as well. And so it makes for a great slouchy hat. And I wear this all the time. This one's made of alpaca, I believe. So it also has more drape than wool. And this is definitely a slouchy hat. Not as warm as some of my other ones, but it's perfect for camping in the summertime and perfect for the cusp seasons. And I also wear it inside a lot on cold mornings. It's probably my favorite and it's so simple. <sighs> okay. I'm just gonna quickly show you some of my other knits. Oh, I forgot a hat. This is the most recent hat that I've made. Um, again, just a variation on the ribbing uh, uh, headband part and then stockinette stitch. And as I like to do, I added a cable panel. So uh, there it is. Very simple hat divided into quadrants for the decreases. And this is a two by two hem or uh, headband part. And then this, um, this cable pattern is beautiful. It's not my own design. This is called, actually I don't know what it's called, but it's from Mimi Cod, um, which is a design website. I will post the link to that in the show notes so that you can do this if you want. The design is really beautiful. I just love that. Um, and you can just take the simple elements of the design and make a tree that's, you know, taller or shorter or has more branches. You can really play around with it. And uh, yeah, this is what this looks like on. I like to have a tree sort of at the front of my head and then one at the side. Another head piece that I've made recently from leftover wool from my uh, Carbath knit. It's just a headband. These are really easy to make as well. Um, this is a brioche uh, stitch, so not great for, for beginners, um, but something to aspire to. It looks like ribbing, but it actually has a lot more loft in it. It's very, very squishy and traps a lot of air, so it's very warm. Great for headbands because your head, the rest of your head can kind of get cold if you're not uh, wearing a toque. But if you're doing some physical activity, even if it's negative 15 outside, like if you're cross country skiing or something like that, a headband I find is the best thing to wear because it keeps your ears protected and warm, but allows you to shed some extra heat that you're gonna be generating from skiing. So I, I didn't have a headband and I had just enough yarn to make one. So this was an excellent way to use that leftover yarn. And then I had to knit this twice 
The first time, I thought I could incorporate the twist and then put the seam at the back using Kitchener stitch. But when I got to the point at which I wanted to add a twist, I realized I hadn't been doing the brioche right. I was off by one stitch and it just didn't, when I did the twist, it didn't line up again on the other side. So I had to unknit it and basically what I did was knit a long rectangle and then when I got to the point where I wanted a twist, I, um, I split one of the rectangles right in the center and made two little legs so it kind of was like a V like this and the other side was just flat like that and I twisted those and then seamed them just by sewing. So it's not, it's not the most elegant way to make a twisted headband, that's for sure. But overall, I think it doesn't look that bad. It doesn't look like a braid, um, but it doesn't look bad either. And so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I would like to try it again and um, have more of a seamless look with using Kitchener stitch at the back and then having the twist be truly incorporated into the fabric. But pretty happy with the way this turned out. Headbands can be tricky because you want it to be thick enough, wide enough here to cover your ears without having to fuss with it too much, but you don't want it to be so thick that it forces your hair up at the back or that it is so big that it tends to slide off. So. Um, Good to sort of try it on a little bit as you're knitting, just sort of hold it up and make sure that it's the right thickness. Okay, I don't wanna to spend too much more time showing you my old knits, but um, I will quickly show you some of the scarves that I've made, the neck, the neck pieces that I've made. I'll start with the first uh, few that I made for my partner. He um, He's a little bit sensitive to wool. So for these pieces, I used Cascade, I believe it's Cascade 220, it's their non-superwash wool. It's, it is remarkably soft for being non-superwash. I generally don't like to use non-superwash, both for the feeling and also for environmental reasons. Um, I'm sure there are lots of uh, online resources that you, that you can check out if you wanted to read about superwash wool. If you're unfamiliar with um, if you're unfamiliar with its advantages or its its disadvantages, um, I guess the gist of it is that the advantage is that um, you can wash it uh, without worrying too much about shrinkage. And um, the other advantage is that uh, if you are sensitive uh, to wool, if you find it itchy, superwash uh, really won't be itchy. However, in my, in my opinion, the main disadvantage um, putting aesthetics aside is uh, the environmental uh, issues with its production. It is plasticized um, and then I believe there are some other sort of chemical processes that go into producing it that make it not as environmentally friendly as a more minim minimally processed pure wool uh, fabric. So anyway, but this is made with Cascade, they're non-superwash uh, pure wool yarn. And um, the first thing I made him was this cabled scarf. Now, I did not use a pattern for this. I just looked up pictures of men wearing scarves on the internet and found something that I thought looked nice that was both beautiful and looked practical and a little bit masculine, but with, you know, some beautiful details. So, but in retrospect, so this did take a long time to knit, but in retrospect, this is a pretty easy knit. Um, it's just the same cable repeated however many times you want to get the width of the scarf with, um, of course, a couple purl stitches in between to really set off the cable and then some uh, plain knit stitches in between, sort of like a ribbing. Um, and then I just did a border on the bottom that's just a ribbing border and then the ribs kind of then end up forming the twisted cables there. So I'm very happy with that one. I also made for him a cowl, which he really does like to wear. He wears it inside. Um, so the secret about cowls, 
I've made quite a few and I've unknit quite a few. I've probably unknit more than I actually have successfully made. Because um, again, not following a pattern. It took me a while to figure out that what you want in a cowl, you need some drape. Um, either because of the way the fabric is knit or because of the sort of volume of the fabric, you need it to drape. And you also want the cowl to be generally longer this way than it is this way. Or if it's long this way, it really should be long enough that you can wrap it twice. And then that helps you achieve um, a balance between snugness around your neck to keep you warm, um, but also like the appropriate sort of drape here to look nice. Otherwise it kind of ends up looking like a collar and I've done that. So this one is, this is a waffle stitch by the way. Just knit and purl stitches, easy, with a bit of a garter, a little bit of a garter ridge around the edge. And um, I made it big enough that it could cover his neck and really trap air, but also that if he wanted to, if his ears got cold, he could put it on like a cowl, like a hood style cowl. So actually I need to make one of these for myself because I'm always uh, very envious of him when he wears it. So that might be another uh, project for me to start on when I am in between sweaters. I've also made a scarf for myself. This might be one of the very first projects I made. I think the first project I made was a scarf. It was just all done in uh, garter stitch. So just knitting back and front. And I made two of those scarves just to learn, just to learn how to do the knit stitch and to learn about knitting in general. And then I moved on to um, learning how to purl. And I just, I found this gorgeous yarn at a yarn store in Kingston, Ontario. Um, I don't know what it was called. I don't know if it's still there. She sold yarn and wine and it smelled great in there. It smelled like, like just natural, lovely fibers and wine. It was awesome. And I found this beautiful, beautiful alpaca yarn. It was, it's variegated. I believe it's a two ply. Um, so a worsted weight two ply with um, a bit of a, a light uh, strand and then more of a um, peachy beige strand, all natural alpaca colors. I don't know if you can see the variegation a little bit. And I just loved the yarn so much. I, I remember being really in love with alpaca. Um, I still love alpaca, but I mostly knit with wool. Um, but every time I wear the scarf, I think, wow, I really should knit with a bit with some more alpaca because it's it really is gorgeous. Um, so I just I just came up with a simple design. It's the whole scarf is bordered by garter stitch, probably I don't know four or six stitches maybe. I'm not sure what I did. And then this is just a basket weave texture stitch where you um, I think I probably did it looks like six so I would knit six purl six knit six knit, knit six purl six across the row and also up six rows um, and then you get this basket weave texture and I love this scarf every time I wear it I get compliments um, I think because the yarn is so beautiful on its own the stitch texture just adds a little bit of interest without detracting from the yarn. And um, so it has a real uh, elegant look to it. And it was the simplest thing to knit. So I'm really, I'm really proud of that one. Sometimes it's okay to just do something simple and you can be very pleased with the results. And the final thing I want to show you that I uh, knit without a pattern is this cowl, a little more complicated than the last one I showed you. Um, this, I believe, was knit with Cascade Eco. I have yet to look up what the eco means in that. Um, if you know, just please let me know. I'd love to find out. Uh, otherwise, that's what I'm going to do after this recording. I'm going to research that um, because Cascade does produce a lot of yarn. It's affordable and um, it's a good intro yarn for many people. 
as I said, because it's not really that itchy and it is affordable and it comes in so many colors. Um, so when I see the Eco, I like to buy that version, but I don't actually know what that means yet. So I, would, I will be looking into that. Um, anyway, so this is made with Cascade Eco and what I wanted was a cowl that had a twist in it. Okay. But I wanted also for the pattern, the stitch pattern to be reversible because that would bother me if it was twisted and then you'd be seeing the backside. Sometimes the backside of knitting is beautiful, um, but it's still, in my mind, it's still the backside. Um, so I just, I wanted something to be reversible, but I also wanted something really, really textured. Um, so I did some research and I found, well, first of all, I found this never ending cable. So you see how it sort of looks like, it looks like waves or um, intertwined roots that kind of merge into each other. They fuse into each other, kind of like um, hyphae fusing together to make mycelial networks. I'm just reading about that right now. Um, so I found that never ending cable. It's on its own, it's not reversible. Um, but I just liked the idea. It seemed to fit with the overall idea of the twisted reversible cowl. And then I just did that cable in one by one ribbing, which ends up being reversible. So it's pretty stretchy and squishy this way, and it's also squishy this way. And this is what it, this is what it looks like on. I like to have the twist either at the front like that, or sometimes I'll put it um, a little off to the side like that. And I wear this a lot too. It really is quite warm. Um, so I do wear this on really cold days. I can even, uh, because it's so wide, I can sometimes tuck the collar of my coat underneath it and it will go around the collar and I don't feel strangled at all. So yeah, I wear this a lot. This was a, a good success in terms of knitting something without a pattern. It was probably the most complicated piece that I've done without a pattern. And um, one of the things that's most uncertain in terms of fit and yet it turned out really well and I'm, I'm very happy with it. Now I did knit a different version of this uh, before this one came to be. I knit a tube collar with um, cables, vertical cables, and um, it looked like an Elizabethan collar. It looked, it did not look good. It was beautiful on its own just as a piece of fabric, but it, um, it looked like I was being strangled by, by my knitting. So I had to re-envision that quite a bit. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with this result. I am thinking that this one might make a good written pattern because um, it, it, is, it is accessible for um, sort of advanced beginners. And it's complicated enough that I think it does warrant um, a written pattern. And um, I think it could be quite popular. I think people would really enjoy wearing this and be quite proud of their knitting. So I'm, I'm considering writing this one down. Let me know what you think. Okay, I had to tie my hair back because it was bothering me a little bit. So here I am again. Um, so that's all I want to show you for uh, sort of older knits today. I just want to, I'll talk about what I'm wearing. Um, this is a design from an Alefoss Lopi design book. It's from book number 18. It's probably backwards, but uh, you get the idea. I got this in Iceland, the book, a long time ago uh, when I visited for the first time and I went to the Hand Knitting Association of Iceland. And yeah, the book has been a great purchase, it was not expensive and so far I've knit four designs from that book over the years, two for myself and uh, one for my partner and one for my sister most recently. They're great sweaters. I, first of all, am absolutely in love with Icelandic yarn, as you can probably tell already. Um, 
it has both the long and short hairs that uh, older breeds of sheep have that more, um, uh, I don't want to say rustic because the sheep themselves are not rustic. It's that they're, um, they haven't been um, interbred so much in, in the modern era. So um, they still retain some of the characteristics that older or even more wild sheep might have had. So they have an undercoat that's sort of softer and um, downy and shorter, shorter in terms of its fiber length. And then they have an, uh, an overcoat that has, um, that's longer, more coarse hairs. Um, but in Icelandic sheep, this is an advantage for knitwear um, because it um, makes a very lofty, uh, a very lofty fabric. Um, but once knitted up, those long hairs um, overall act like they have a long, they have a longer staple length, and it makes a really strong fabric once it's knit together. Um, so you can have two things in one in a if you use Icelandic yarn. Um, but beyond that, I just I love the sheep. They're they're really beautiful. Um, they're a non-polled breed, so they still have their horns. The females still have horns are yeah horns and um, they come in different colors as well so natural shades in their wool which is just so beautiful so you can get undyed yarn that is gorgeous um, but then also the dyed yarn has a very uh, warm quality to the color um, I think because of the natural color coming through uh, in, in from the sheep um, and of course I love the texture I love the, I love the feeling of rustic yarn in general. Um, it's just so beautiful. I love, um, in my imagination, being connected to the natural place that the yarn came from. So yeah, I love Icelandic yarn. So I've made a few sweaters from this book. This one here was the second sweater I made. I, um, I knit this at a bit of a tighter gauge because I envisioned it more of like a jacket that I could wear outside. Um, so it's not quite as lofty and light as some of the sweaters are intended to be, um, but it is extremely warm. And um, it was my first steaking project. So steaking is when you, um, you knit sort of a bridge, that's what steak means. Um, you sort of knit some extra stitches where you want to make a cut or an opening in your sweater. And then once you're done the sweater um, that's knit in the round, you cut those stitches and um, then sew on a trim of some kind, so in this case a button band. Um, yeah, and Icelandic yarn is a good place to start if you're new to steaking because it really um, grabs onto itself. It's a very sticky yarn. It felts well too, so um, you can cut your stitches and not be too, not be overly concerned that your whole sweater is going to unravel. In fact, I did a pretty sloppy job of the steaking and um, there, there are some stitches that are have crept away from there and are, are I can see that they're loose in here. This might be one of them. Um, I, I should fix them, but I've been wearing this sweater a lot and they haven't come undone. So that's just a testament to uh, the advantages of Icelandic yarn. Anyway, so yeah, this is my, I'm pretty proud of this one. Um, it has these beautiful buttons on it. Um, I found these Celtic, this Celtic design at a thrift store, and then I found these at my local sewing shop. They're the same brand though, and exactly the same size and the same material. So um, I call this sweater the Celtic caribou because of the buttons. And uh, I can't really show you, I have one, a sweater blocking right now for my partner. It's in that room right there on the floor. I don't really want to take you over there, but um, I'll show, maybe I'll show it to you when it's done. I'll certainly post it on Instagram. But I, for him, I did this design and his colors are, he, he looks good in colder colors. So I did a blue, a blue uh, sort of gradient. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm wearing. I've knit four designs out of this book so far and I'm sure the, the most recent one will not be my last. Um, I guess I'll show you what I am currently working on as well. I 
I do tend to have a few projects on the go at one time and I think the reason for that is that as as you probably know knitting takes a while especially if you're doing a garment and uh, I do knit every day but sometimes I just I want to in, continue enjoying what I'm knitting and so for me that means sometimes I need to experience a different texture or a different color. I'm very sensitive to color and it, it can affect my mood, I think, or um, I'm not really sure. I might talk about that in a later episode, but sometimes I just, I get bored of a color, let's just say that, and I need to see something else to um, reinvigorate my interest in um, the projects that I'm working on. So I like to change it up a little bit to feel something new and to see a different color. Those are probably the main reasons. Um, so I'm working on um, a design by uh, Isabel Kramer. She has a lot of designs on Ravelry and um, she's a very well-known designer and um, her style, uh, she has little details in her sweaters, but the overall shape and feel and style of them is very contemporary and very wearable. So um, I, I decided to do one of her patterns and actually I purchased another one of her patterns that I'm probably going to start on after this one um, just to add some more sweaters into my wardrobe that are handmade and beautiful but um, maybe not as colorful or not as not as uh, visually stimulating as this one. So I um, this pattern is called I'll post it. I'll post it when I find it. I just can't remember. The other pattern that I purchased is called uh, Circe or Circe. I'm not really sure how it's pronounced. So that's the, what's stuck in my head. I can't remember what this one's called. Um, but it's really cool. It features a broken rib pattern on the front and on the sleeves sort of at the top of the yoke and it's a raglan yoke so yeah I'm I'm enjoying this I'm now I've begun the all stockinette st uh, section which is just fine um, I can knit while I'm watching TV or something at night and I don't mind that um, but yeah I'm really enjoying this one this yarn that I'm using is 100% um, merino it's the Gilead from uh, De Rerum Natura it's beautiful. I This is the first time for me knitting with um, merino yarn and it's not rustic. It's not what I typically like, but uh, it's it's not overproduced either. It's, it's beautiful. The color is absolutely gorgeous. I guess the merino really takes color well and um, it's a very matte color, but still very rich looking and the texture is is really beautiful. It's very soft, very squishy, and it just feels it feels luxurious to knit with. It's very beautiful. And I know that the sweater is going to be very comfortable to wear. So I'm really enjoying that right now. And uh, I'm just going to get my other project that I'm working on. Okay, I'm also working on um, a shawl. I don't typically make shawls because I find something about the way that the increases work um, I find frustrating. I'm not really sure why. Um, maybe it's the repetition, but in any case I'm working on a shawl because I really like wearing shawls and so I figure I should have some that I've made myself. And uh, despite my previous experience with shawl knitting, I'm loving this design. This is the uh, Haligarth design by Gudrun Johnson and it's it's beautiful. I love her designs in general. I love her shawl designs especially. Um, they're just, they're simple, not necessarily simple to knit, although this one is pretty easy, um, or pretty approachable. They're simple in their design elements and very, very beautiful. I just love them. Um, so this, but this is the first design I'm knitting by her, so I'm looking forward to trying some other ones. Um, it's a Shetland, uh, Tree of Life pattern, I believe. Um, anyway, gorgeous pattern. This is knit in the Rowan felted tweed, and I believe the pine color 
and it has little flecks of other colors. You can see there's some blue in there, some yellow and orange, a little bit of white. It's gorgeous. Um, yeah, I'm finding it a very meditative knit. You have to pay attention and um, because it's, fu it's fine, it's not lace uh, yarn weight or anything like that, but it is still a finer movements with your hands and um, you have to be careful not to drop those yarn overs uh, because I'm not that experienced in lace knitting and if I drop a yarn over, um, it's kind of lost. So you have to be really careful, sort of slow and intentional with each stitch and I'm enjoying that as an alternative to some of my other knitting projects. Um, so I'm really enjoying going back to this one and I, I'm obviously looking forward very much to wearing it but it's going to be a few months before that's possible. And the other thing that is still on my needles is a project that I started for my partner oh, a couple years ago and uh, I'm still working away on it. I've finished some other things for him so I don't feel that bad. Um, but, uh, oh, that's all tangled. I found a really cool slip stitch pattern that is explained on Very Pink Knit's YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if she has a name for it or not. Um, it's just, it's a slip stitch pattern and uh, it creates a very dense fabric, almost like a woven fabric. And um, you can do it in single, single color or t double color. I'm using two different colors here, two grays, sort of a light gray and a dark gray. And um, yeah, that's the right side and this is the wrong side. Both are attractive. But again, to me, because this is the pearl side, it really does look like the wrong side. So this is the right side. And uh, if you haven't guessed already, this is for a man. It's a tie that I'm making. Ties are a lot longer than you might expect because they're always tied up. So there's a lot of fabric that gets stuck in the knot. And so I've just been knitting on this for a long time. It's easy to knit. Um, it's fun to knit. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that'll be done soon. I just need to sort of apply myself to it because um, given my other projects that I have on the go, which are a little bit more interesting, I kind of put this to the side a lot, but it's, it is going to be beautiful when it's done. Very textural. And I, I saw somewhere when I was thinking of making a tie for him, I did some research on uh, wool ties, wool and uh, knitted silk ties. And because um, I didn't want to make a tie that just looked like a tie that someone knit. I wanted it to look like a piece of an article of clothing that has a that existed in a in a certain context, um, and sure enough, uh, knitted ties were a thing at some point, and um, so I wanted to make something that um, fit within that context. And it turns out um, the point on ties um, in knitted ties specifically that point that sort of V at the bottom wouldn't have been included. Um, typically, hand-knit ties would have just been knit flat, like this, um, which was to my advantage because I couldn't figure out how to do that V with this slip stitch pattern anyway. Um, but I kind of like the look of it as well. To me, it looks like it's meant to be this way. It doesn't look like I tried to um, imitate the shape of a typical um, you know, factory made woven silk tie. It looks like this is a knitted tie and it always was meant to be a knitted tie. So I kind of like that. Um, and then if you're interested in what fabric or what yarn I'm using for this, um, this is a wool and silk blend. There's just a little bit of silk in it. Um, it gives it maybe a little bit of that sound that silk has. Um, it gives it some softness, of course, and durability as well, because it's going to be tied up a lot. Wool will tend to stretch quite a bit in doing that to it on a daily basis, um, but the silk will help it hold its shape a little bit better. And um, also, the, the yarn is very beautiful. I thought it maybe gave it uh, just a little bit of a more of a maybe specialty quality. 
um, it's really hard to see in the camera, but it has, uh, silk can have these little sort of, when it's spun in a yarn, has these like little, they're not really pills, but they're like little flecks, um, just like a texture that's not smooth, but it, it, it catches your eye, it catches the light a little bit. It's very beautiful. Um, so yeah, I'm really enjoying this yarn. I would probably use this yarn for other projects as well. Um, uh, but for now, it's just this tie. I don't know the brand of the yarn, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so I think that's probably it for today for my very first podcast ever. I've probably talked a little bit too much, um, but I really appreciated being able to share some of these things with you. Um, I guess I just would like to finish with maybe reiterating why I'm doing this or what kinds of things I'm sharing with you and what it means to me. Um, the reason why I'm wearing a Lopapeza today is, besides the ones I've already mentioned, because they, to me, when I sort of first started knitting, I was really, really drawn to rustic yarns, rustic sweaters, um, really practical clothing, and the sort of, the knitting tradition um, of all these different cultures that have been knitting for many, many decades before me. And um, I like, that's what I like about knitting the most is um, that it, it's a very, it can be a very uh, rustic, homey, um, comforting uh, endeavor. And I really, I, I'm nourished by it. Um, in those ways. I find it soothing and that's what I love about knitting. I love that it allows me to make things for myself that are both practical and um, exciting but also to make things for people I love that are um, that they find uh, very useful and very comforting. Um, so that's, I hope to explore some of those themes with you and to share some of those things with you and hopefully hear from you about um, your interests. And uh, yeah, that would be, that would be great because I also knit alone. That's, that's been how I've done it ever since I started. Um, and I, of course, watch, watch other people's uh, YouTube videos and I have learned most of what I know from knitting uh, about knitting from the internet, um, from people posting on the internet, which is just amazing and so generous. Um, but I do hope to maybe make some connections with other people in the knitting world. That would be truly amazing. So those are some of my hopes for next time. And um, yeah. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have something finished to show you next time. Uh, maybe I'll cast on something new. And um, maybe, who knows, maybe I'll show you some of the other crafts that aren't knitting that I'm working on. They mostly all involve wool. Um, but I've really gotten into other needle crafts lately. And uh, it's nice to just sort of take, take a break from knitting every once in a while and try something else. So maybe I'll share some of those things with you. If you saw any of my knits today that you you think I should write a pattern for, please let me know and uh, give me some encouragement to get started on that project. I, um, I generally don't, I've just learned this about myself and I'm sure my family has known this about me much longer than I have, um, that I don't really operate with goals. I operate, uh, I operate based on my dreams and um, I have lots of dreams and sometimes I need a bit of a push to uh, make those dreams reality. So if you see, if you saw um, one of my knits that you think would be great in a written up pattern, please let me know because I am, I am hoping to uh, write a pattern soon. 
I guess that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and uh, I hope to be back with you very soon. Take care.